Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Focus Group Podcast. I'm Sarah Longwell, publisher of The Bulwark, and I hope all of you groupies, which is what I'm calling people who listen to The Focus Group now, uh, are excited for part two of our season premiere, Palooza. And as I think we demonstrated on last week's show, you can kind of put this Republican primary into two categories, before Trump's indictments and after. Today, we're checking in on how the rest of the field has been faring, uh, which is that they've becoming more they've been becoming more and more of a lost cause uh, since Trump started getting indicted. Now, to be clear, as you may remember from last season, a critical piece of Republican voters were at one time very much considering moving on from Trump. But there's a key problem. Republican voters think Trump did a pretty good job as president. And Ron DeSantis, uh, who once looked attractive and electable as an alternative, has fallen off in a major way. Now, Vivek Ramaswamy is capturing some of that DeSantis attention currently. Uh, And then there's also Mike Pence and uh, two South Carolinians trying to get some attention or maybe a spot on Trump's ticket. Who can say? Uh, And then there's people like Chris Christie and Asa Hutchinson. And Tim and I can fight about Chris Christie uh, in a little bit. Uh, That's right. You heard me. My guest today is the Bulwark's own Tim Miller. Tim, thank you for being here, buddy. Happy to be here. Uh, You know, right on the heels of Jake Tapper. Just a little handsome, handsome duo to get started. I know know a theme when I see one. Yeah. Uh, I will say, speaking of just physical appearances, I forgot... (laughs) that we were doing this uh, for video and mm. went on a run right beforehand. So I do look a shade tomato-y on the <laughs> A little YouTube. flush. A little flush. <laughs> uh, okay. But, you know, this is just... At least it's just... not a sunburn. We've got such loyal listeners, and it's cute. Sometimes it gets a little annoying, but it's so cute. So I'll come on after, you know, spend a little a weekend outside at the pool, and I'll have listeners be like, did you put on your sunscreen, young man? You're looking a little... T- <laughs> so for listeners who are worried that you might be burnt, no, that's not it. Just a little yeah, flush. This is, this is what happens if I do any exercise whatsoever. Uh, what do you think of groupies? Do we think... Do we like I love, groupies? I, love, I, it- I cackled. I cackled. Yeah. I like uh, it. This is like, this is, see, running is good. It clears my head. And then I think, because mm-hmm. you know what? I got to say, speaking of our listeners, they were like hostile about the Bulwark or about the Focus Group podcast being off the, mm. like, our longish hiatus, mm. which I just want to explain, you know, with Jake Tapper last week, we had to like move, move, move. But since it's Tim, we can, uh, we don't, we don't need to be so formal we this can time around. A little bit. And I'll say the reason we had to take such a long hiatus is that I don't want, it was painful for me. It was more painful for me than it was for you. Uh, But I want to be able to go through the 2024 election without stopping. And so, you know, that's a lot of shows between now and 2024. You're committing to that? You're not even taking Christmas off? We're here, September I mean, I might take Christmas off, but like, I, I just... It is hard for me not to communicate the focus groups to people. I, I mean, this noticed. summer was tough. Uh, but also, what was great is, like, the the I, the I level of annoyance from people that we were off. Like, people would, like, yell at me. Like, Longwell, what are you doing? Are you lazy? Like, where's the focus group podcast? And I want to tell you, that makes me very happy. I like being yelled at uh, by the groupies. The focus groupies. Groupies. I love it. All right, Tim. So... You have this thesis about this particular Republican primary that you wrote about in the Bulwark a couple months ago, and you said there are two Republican primaries going on and only one is real. Please explain. Yeah, I, look, I, my my thesis is essentially that there's a real primary that's taking place among the voters that will decide who the Republican nominee is. Uh, many of the voters in these focus groups, um, they have strong views about where the where the party should go. Uh, while we're shouting out each other's articles in the Bulwark, you wrote one a little while back about the you know, fact that there's a before Trump element to the party and an after Trump. And, and no matter what actually happens to Trump, most of the voters of the Republican Party are happy with that switch uh, to the more MAGA, more populist, more punchy, whatever you want to call it. Uh, they're, they like the Trumpian version of the Republican Party. And so those voters you know, were looking at this field. They liked Trump, uh, like you said in that intro. Some of them were in the Trump cult and were never going to leave them. There was another group, I think that was the key group in this primary, that liked Trump but was looking around. But they were only looking around for 
people that represented that post-Trump party, right? And so they were interested in Ron DeSantis. Uh, they wanted to take him for a walk around the block. Um, Vivek was going to be appealing to them. Uh, after that, the rest of this field uh, is, isn't really doing that much to appeal to that to that group, with maybe one exception we can get into. And so uh, the real primary was taking place among those voters, the voters that like Trump, and we're deciding whether they want to re-up with him or look around. There is a, then another group of people, um, you know, maybe about 20% of the Republican primary electorates, not enough to win, but a huge majority of donors and, and political strategists and commentators on the Republican side who don't like Trump and, and want to go back to the pre-Trump party in some form or another. And they have been participating in a fantasy primary that's very well financed uh, and has a lot of money in it with a lot of TV ads and a lot of discussion and podcasts and, and cable news hits and all and and you know all of this where they talk about what might happen um, uh, you know if, if the person you know that emerges from that fantasy primary wins but they don't actually have a plan to win and, and most of the people participating in the real primary the MAGA voters like barely even know that it's happening <laughs> like, they, don't, they don't know anything about Tim Scott like they don't know they know they don't like Mike Pence that they're not paying attention to the jockeying and so you know we've had this kind of weird bifurcated primary that like one of which that takes place among you know candace owens listeners and and you know newsmax watchers and another one that takes place among a kind of dc the political class yeah you know i saw a news story uh in which a reporter was hypothesizing who might mike pence choose as his vice president and tim scott there was it, one of these as well for tim scott this week it's like and it was like, because it was positing, Mike Pence was open to choosing a woman, but he like can't dine alone with her because mother disapproves, right? And I, But I was just like, this whole thing is just not even a real conversation. Mike Pence will never choose a vice president. Mike Pence can't, as JVL likes to point out all the time, our colleague, he can't walk through a Trump rally without security for his physical safety. This guy's not going to be choosing a vice president anytime soon. Tim Scott was also asked this. Did you? I, I guess you might have missed this. Did you see who he posited is on his short who, list? Is it, this is is it fun Trump? fantasy? It's like Risk. We're playing. You know, it's like we're playing. Like you know, I, I'm taking over. You know, the U Ukraine. Ukraine is not weak. You know, I've taken over Africa. Um, in in model in model presidency, Tim Scott threw out uh, Mike Pompeo, Trey Gowdy. Um, oh, Trey I Gowdy. Yes. Yeah, I forget the third one. Um, it was three white guys. It was Mike Pompeo and Trey <laughs> Gowdy. It's like, oh, that's that's a fun little thing to imagine if you're Tim sure. Scott, who you might pick. Mike Pompeo, who clearly ran the numbers on whether or not he had any purchase in the Republican <laughs> Party and opted out of running his own yeah. campaign. Right. Uh, okay. So before we get into the clips, uh, I want to make something clear. You're gonna, you're hearing this show after the second GOP debate. And we will have ta we'll talk about that in our topper. Uh, but all of the focus group sound in today's show is referring to the debates uh, back in August. So the first debate. Now, I know we just did a whole episode on Trump, but I feel like we can't start this show without giving you a taste of what we've heard in recent months about why Republican voters don't want to move on from Trump. So let's listen. We need to stand back, look at his record, see what he's done. It was the best four years that we have all mm -hmm. had in the last 10, uh, it was a great time. None of us can say it is now. We need a man that is strong as hell, a brick house, and he is that man, and we need him back. And, and let him continue to poke at him. Let him continue to persecute. It'll only work in their disfavor, believe me. I know how Trump is. I know he says a lot, but he gets the job done, and that's, that's kind of where my stance is. It could take a little bit to move me off that stance. He deserves paid for all the bullshit they put him through. And the best way would be to win the presidency back. And if he doesn't get in, nobody else is going to hit the ground running. I think it's a, a, another opportunity for him to try to finish what he started. Similar to her saying he can finish what he started, I feel like he got undercut from the time that he could have. And that there's more that he wanted to do and more that he could do, more that he's willing to do that he should be given the chance to. I feel like he got shortchanged last time around with the whole COVID business. So, Tim, uh, 
Mm. Like he's a he's like a brick wall. He's a, he's brick, like a brick house. Wall. Brick he's house. So yeah. strong. I'd like to. See, we should. No, we should definitely. My uh, the the challenge, the athletic challenge between Biden and Trump. I feel like is what the country needs at this point. I, I want to see Donald Trump so. shirtless. Maybe a triathlon. Let's see him swimming and just see that brick house <laughs> body that he's got underneath there. So you know, I think there's a lot of sort of people in consultant land, uh, and and maybe so we argue this from time to time that we we think that there's a world where people could really be attacking Trump on sort of competency, right? Like he didn't build the wall, mm -hmm. uh, the ballooning national debt. But what I am struck by these uh, little selections here that we just played, they are so consistent across the groups. Like that is just like a little taste uh, because they this idea that Trump did a great job is just replete through the groups. And so how can somebody credibly attack his competence with Republican voters when he is th when they think he's like the greatest president of their lifetimes. It's really challenging. They, and these guys all did this to themselves, the Trump challengers that bind, you know, they, they bound themselves in this little trap rhetorically. Because uh, I know, is, is this not what every Fox host said, what every Republican politician said for all four years? Uh, you know, I don't love all the tweets. You know, I don't love the mean tweets, but really the policies, he's doing a great job. He's a strong leader. That lands with people. That, you know, that resonated with people. And, and I do think, you know, the first three years of his presidency, we got, we talked about this a lot in real time, we got kind of lucky. Like there weren't crises, you know, the economy was slowly but surely on the same improving track it had been on for a decade, you know, but it was kind of peaking on that. You know, that was a gradual it, yeah, it was getting gradually better and better ever since the Great Recession. Um, and so I, I think that that resonated with people. They're like, all the people that I respect and trust said he was doing a good job and that all the people that criticized him had TDS. And, and you know, my economic position was getting gradually better until the pandemic happened. And um, and then, you know, when, when they had the opportunities to kind of point out his failures, None of them did. They all made excuses for him throughout the entire presidency. So I do think then it becomes very challenging in 2023 to come on the scene and talk about the guy who you ran an ad talking about how you how you want to teach your kids to be like him because he's such a strong leader and now say, well, actually, he wasn't that great. I mean, you know, the wall, the wall didn't quite get built. And, you know, it becomes very challenging to do that at that later date. You seem like the disingenuous one. In a campaign with Trump, the professional liar, it makes you seem like you're the liar because you were lying. But it's just you're telling the truth now, but you'd been lying for, you know, seven years. So let me ask you, so obviously we talk about this a lot, the sort of the collective action problem uh, of Republicans. If all of the candidates, like I'm sorry, I, one thing I wonder about, I, that I genuinely don't know the answer to, is like, was it definitely always going to go this way? Or if Ron DeSantis had been a different human um, okay. and made different choices about which constituency he was going to try to appeal to, the natural one of people who wanted to move on from Trump as opposed to sort of wrestling Trump for the always Trumpers. But like if all of them had acted like Chris Christie, if Pence, Christie, DeSantis, Haley, if they'd all trained their fire on Trump and talked about electability, moving on, he didn't do this thing, would, would that have worked? Like is there a world, and if they were competent at it, right? They're not yeah. all doing this weird, uh, no, he was a great president, but I just disagree with him. Like if they all went hard. Yeah, I'd love to rerun and see it. I I, I think that it's possible. I, I don't, I, I think that both sides are possible. I don't know. It, it might, this might've been fait accompli. We won't know, right? But I, yeah. I just think that after the election in the midterms, that moment was so stark where people were, were, were moving on from, you were seeing it in the focus groups. It was yeah. showing up in the qua quantitative data. It's showing up everywhere. Rupert is talking about how we're taping this on the day that Rupert announced he retires. Uh, yeah, peace out, buddy. Um, uh, Rupert is, uh, you know, saying he's ready to move on. Had every had by and if everybody then means like everybody, even Laura Ingram was starting to say this, right? Like had, had not just the candidates, right? Had, had the entire triangle of doom or the two thirds of your triangle of doom, you know, all said, guys, come on. Like, we can't do this again. We just lost every one of the Trump, you know, endorsed candidates in the midterms. Let's talk about how he's a loser. Let's talk about how he's delusional in the election. Uh, let's. Uh, could that have worked? 
Nate, and and had their the person they were you know putting all their eggs in one basket not been around DeSantis, you know, and that's a lot of ifs. But I don't think that it was. I don't think it was fate accompli. I, I think that there was a window to do it, and and they were just too cowardly to to attempt it. Yeah, so I agree with this. This is also my assessment, um, and you're right. We can't run this counterfactual for real. But I but one thing I can be really sure of is that everybody decided to say from from Sununu to Paul Ryan, just every Trump can't win. He he won't win and he can't win. Well, you know what? If that's your only argument, not that it was immoral, not that he tried to stage a coup, not that he is uh, too old and not that he actually didn't do a good job. Like if, if it's only that he can't win, the second he starts polling even with Biden or anywhere in the range, your argument's gone. And that's all they did. They all chose this incredibly safe route that was just, look, I'm on side, I'm on the team, but, you know, he can't win. He won't be the nominee. Um, you know, I mean, as uh, so wrong, so wrong. Well, let me just, um, I want to talk for a second. So as much as the indictments have rallied people around Trump, I want because I want to talk about DeSantis, because that's where you were going with this. Ron DeSantis is also sort of not the great electable white knight. He used to be he was really riding high, as you just noted, after the 2022 elections. You know, he just won by 19 points. Uh, and Trump's, all Trump's favorite candidates had lost. But now, today, the real clear politics average uh, for the Biden-DeSantis matchup is Biden plus 2.8. And the Biden-Trump average is Trump plus 0.05. Uh, so Boy. Biden is outperforming DeSantis. Trump's outperforming Biden. So Heck the of a day job, before, Jeff Rowe. And yeah, Jeff Rowe. I hope he never works in politics again. Uh, the day before we take the show, we just got a New Hampshire poll that saw DeSantis fall from a high point of 43% in that same poll in January. He's now down to 10% in the latest poll. And he is in fifth place. Fifth place. Mm. So to be clear, DeSantis is still in national polling in the upper echelon of the field uh, and with voters in the groups. But I think a lot more negativity has creeped in since we last talked about him on the show. And I think that explains uh, a lot of his fade. Uh, so let's listen. When DeSantis said he was running, I was pretty happy about that. But he's just gotten killed to the polls. I mean, he's kind of acted weird. And it just seems like he lost all his confidence that he used to have when he was a governor. Now he is too polarizing even more so than Trump in certain fashions. Um, but I like him. I mean, I, I think uh, I think he's a good leader. Uh, people love him in Florida. He's fine. Um, he's uh, less aggressive than Trump. And he is a policy wonk, so he knows how to sort of pull the levers of government. There might be a couple things about his personality that seem a little wooden. Um, he might need to work on that. DeSantis yeah. was a great governor. I don't know, but something's weird. Something weird is going on. Why do you think he's weird? He's gone quiet. It's like somebody is paying him to stay quiet. Yeah, his whole personality's just changed. He's not as mouthy as he used to be. He's not as like, you know, let's let's beat him up. Let's go. This is stupid as he used to be. And, you know, if I thought... Gotten soft. Yeah, I think he's gotten soft. I think he's gone quiet and he's gotten soft and he's accepted some money somewhere mm. along the line. He stood a certain way with Trump, and now he is kind of starting to twist things and turn things into the opposite direction. And I think he's great for Florida. I think he's great at running a state. I just don't think that I would trust him to run a country. He is very much one of those political swampy guys. I think that he's very wishy-washy. He comes off a certain way, but when you really watch him, just some of his facial expressions. I just feel like he's um, kind of like a Trump mini, but I like Trump, so not really in the good way. Like if you're gonna have a Trump type personality, which I feel like DeSantis have, just get Trump. Some She's making great points. points. Some really <laughs> compelling points. points in those groups. <laughs> Except for the one lady that seemed to be maybe implying that there was a, a second DeSantis. I don't know why all the magas immediately go to the doppelganger theory. I don't know what it is. If that's some, Can we blame the Marvel movies about that? I don't know. It's very popular. There are two Fettermans. There are two DeSantises. 
I'm not sure it was body double, but like she was suggesting that maybe someone's paying him. Like he's yeah. been bought off. Like there's definitely a conspiracy in there somewhere. It just yeah. isn't clear what the conspiracy is. But uh, uh, I thought the woman that talked about the no, the the Trump, the Trump, mini Trump, why not just have Trump? That was r- right on yeah. brand. But equally on brand was the woman uh, right before her who was saying basically that I thought he was making some great points when he was talking about how good Trump was, but now he's starting to get all squirrely and wishy-washy. This goes back to what we were sa- what I was saying in the intro, right? Just about this notion that like you can't say Trump's the best for seven years and then all of a sudden start criticizing him. People listen to that and, and it so, then to make things sound like something's wrong with you. Uh, that's right. That's right. And you know, uh, I, I've been, if you read some of the stories right now about DeSantis' campaign, the extent of the hedging now, right, they're not trying, they're not winning Iowa, right? They're mm-hmm. now, their expectation setting uh, is all about like, well, if we come in a close-ish close-ish second, uh, then, then you know, we get it down to a two-man race by South Carolina. And I'm like, in what world do the two South Carolinians drop out before their home state to make it a two-man race for you, Ron? I just... Uh, second, third, third, second, question mark, Republican nominee. <laughs> <Yeah. like> that. <laughs> Super Tuesday with states such as Texas and California, Louisiana, where, Trump where, is where Trump's winning by seventy. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right. Um, so you know, uh, no offense, but uh, as part of a campaign, that's oh, a bit, uh, you have worked on some campaigns in which uh, you know things you started. You went from high expectations, people thinking you're the guy establishment favorite and suddenly voters don't like you anymore yeah. uh is do you think the cake's baked on desantis at this point or does he get a second look at all i think it's pretty close I, the ones that think that he does have better than jeb did not i, I don't think anything is better about ron desantis than jeb but about his political prospects is that the iowa electorate does kind of line up with DeSantis a little bit more and much more than it did with Jeb, right? And so he does still have this kind of emergency break glass thing that you just, you know, I I, I think that it's close to dead, but uh, I think that he's better, like he has some position, he can at least do this, so you're saying there's a chance thing, where I don't think that we could, you know, really by this point. It was about October that I knew Jeb's campaign was over, um, and maybe other people might have known by September. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I always said, and I, and I think I've I said this on Next Level, you know, that like in the Jeb campaign, I was like, if we dip below Trump and Marco, it's over. Because people don't really give you a second look. You know, I was like, once you're at the top, it's different to come from the bottom. But like, once we were at the top, I was saying to uh, Mike Murphy, who was at the, working at the, uh, I couldn't talk to Mike Murphy, but I was saying to people that talked to Mike Murphy, who was working on the Jeb Super Pack. You might know Mike Murphy from Hacks on Tap podcast, which Sarah was on recently. Um, you know, he was running the Super Pack, and they had the more money over there. And I was like, we need, we need to spend money to lift Jeb up so that he doesn't drop so far in the polls that you get this loser stink. And DeSantis has the loser stink on him. And now he's obviously way below Trump. But in, in these polls, as you mentioned, he's dipping below Vivek in a couple, uh, below Haley in a couple. And and if that becomes consistent, um, I, I just, you know, it's hard to see why people give him a second look. Uh, you know, it makes much more sense for them to give Haley and Vivek a look. So you mentioned Vivek. Uh, and that's DeSantis's other problem, right? For the people willing to move on from Trump in this primary, there's another hotter candidate uh, that's capturing their imaginations, and that's Vivek Ramaswamy. We're great uh, let's... Of here on hotness. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> let's listen to some of the Ramaswamy love uh, from recent months. On the high level, government needs to be run like a business. On the low level, at the state level, take care of your people. You know, a little bit more take care of your people, but on, on the high level, it needs to be run like a business. And I like that uh, Vivek has that kind of a mindset versus a career politician mindset. And Nikki Haley was really quick to jump on him about him not knowing foreign policy. You know what? No presidential candidate, I don't care who they are, I don't care what side they're on, knows everything about all the different divisions that a president has to, you know, touch and get involved in. That's why they have people they appoint to those positions, advisors, to advise them. 
Ramaswamy has a lot of good responses and comments, and I think he has a very polished message. But my problem with him is that if you look at some of his previous stances, he has flip-flopped on a lot of issues. From what I've heard, like, he's staunchly pro-life. He's, you know, where I am with the gender issues. And I just feel like he's level-headed. I don't feel like he's a loose cannon. I feel like he's articulate. Um, and he seems like he'd be a good leader. So I know he's only pulling third, so not a great chance to make it. But I'm, I'm interested in, you know, hearing more from him and seeing if he can make it, you know. That last woman said DeSantis was her first choice when we eventually asked, which demonstrates a dynamic I've seen play out among a lot of these move on from Trumpers, which is even if people's heads are telling them to go with DeSantis, their hearts are often with Ramaswamy. Uh, but people are just worried he doesn't have a chance. Uh, and for many, though, he's taken over uh, as the Trump without the baggage that DeSantis used to be. Uh, <laughs> Tim, you, I think, early said, you know, if if DeSantis fades, uh, that the person who would replace him is Vivek. Uh, why do you think he's, you know, why do you think he's doing so well with base voters? Two things. Just he doesn't feel like a politician, and he certainly doesn't feel like a politician from the Bush era. And this is what these folks want. Uh, you know, you played the clip of the woman talking about that was giving this lengthy excuse for like how you don't need to know anything about foreign policy to be president. And, and you know, when I watched that entire um, that entire focus group um, that you did, and and there was a lot more along that same vein, right? Um, that they like that they're not a politician, and they will come up with any post hoc excuses that they can for anything that he says that feels like he doesn't know what he's talking about or whatever. It's like, ah, oh, you can bring in people. I thought the people, the experts you'd bring in were the deep state. I don't, they don't really think about that though. So anyway, they they like that he is, you know, not does not feel like a Bush politician. And then you know the other thing, I'm just going to give you this little a little a little scoop from another uh, story I've been working on. I don't know that people have really made this connection, but Vivek and Elise Stefanik like were pals um, at Harvard, and um, and you and once that really clicked with me, and I, you know I've heard they've been talking, and once that really clicked with me, he at least gave him like a roadmap for how you do this, like how you just get, feed people the MAGA stuff they want. I mean, she's been like this test case almost, like in Congress, of somebody that like wasn't MAGA, but but just embraced, you know, put on the costume and embraced it and did it wholeheartedly. And, and in a lot of ways, I think that he was able to watch that and learn from that, where these other folks were all politicians, you know, already. And, and so he was able to kind of jump in here and give, you know, give the dogs the dog food that they like, so to speak. Yeah, so two things on this. Uh, one, I knew that DeSantis was starting to crater with these voters when they started saying he seems like a regular politician. The not a regular politician thing the extent to which that runs so deep in the Republican Party and presents, I think, a real challenge for Republican politicians in the future is just, it can't be overstated. The second thing uh, about Ramaswamy is like, what about this sort of, so this guy like was like a Soros, uh, he was on like a Soros scholarship. He definitely voted for Obama. He was like, it's not just Elise Stefanik, like he was a young Democrat, like not just Main Street Republican moderate, like Elise, right? He was kind of shaping up to be a Dem. Yeah, I think he was that, more like a non pot just like making money. I don't know that he was like a Dem, you know, but I, he did go to a Democratic fundraiser, right? But yeah, I mean, I think he was just like a non-political striving kid. Yeah. What is, I, I guess this, what does this mean going forward for the Republican Party that like, these are the kinds of people that can break out. Uh, and like, if you are <laughs> good on foreign policy, as Nikki Haley is, that actually voters uh, are like, get out of here with all your knowledge and experience. We don't want any of that here. Hate it. Yeah. Give me I, this weird guy who ran some tech company that built people out of money and raps to Eminem. That's and loves Trump. That's what I'm looking for. Yeah. I mean, Mitch uh, called it during the midterms the candidate quality problem. Um, you know, but I do think that it's a per it is a semi permanent issue, right? Because they're you know they're not. Uh, building a bench, right? For all the time, there was like concern about the Democratic bench for a while that wasn't built during the Obama era. I, they're not building a bench in the Trump era because the, they can't find people. Like, it's very challenging to find somebody that is deft enough to do the Trump shtick without coming off like a complete conspiratorial loon.
right? And, and somebody that wants to be in politics who doesn't feel like a politician, right? I, I, you know, so I, I, what I think that this means is that, that there is going to be a lane for a while from somebody that wants to come out of the off the sidelines and just, you know, sing from the MAGA hymn book um, because that's what the, that's what folks want. And there's not a, you know, there's not a long line to get into as Vivek found. Um, now again, it's, it seems it's harder than it seems. Uh, Vivek is, is say what you want about him. He's very talented. Like when I went to see him, like he's, he's obviously smart. He's obviously deft on his feet, but even somebody smart that went to Harvard that's deft on his feet at times, you know, when you start dabbling in conspiracy land, sometimes you start sounding like a lunatic, like when he starts questioning 9-11, right? So, you know, it's it's challenging. So maybe, you know, the Republican Party will be saved from itself because, like, it's just hard to imitate Trump. But I, I think that they're going to be, uh, the party is going to be at risk of having these types of figures, Vivek-type figures, come in from the outside and take over state parties and national and maybe future national campaigns, you know, for a little while. Yeah, well, I think it's clear that if Trump wins a second term, shudder at the thought, oh uh, both Vivek uh, and uh, Elise will probably feature prominently in that administration. For sure. Uh, but let's turn our, our attention to somebody who I think would not feature prominently in that uh, administration, which is Nikki Haley. Uh, so in that first debate, you know, she slapped Vivek around a little bit uh, and was you know, pretty good on substance. And she got generally positive reviews from the focus groups on the day after that debate. Let's listen. You could tell she was very prepared. Um, she really hammered uh, the, what's his name, Vivek guy. She was all over him. I, I was impressed. I liked that, you know, she also emphasize what's realistic you know some candidates they say i want to do this i want to do that she's like yeah but what's realistic of congress like what can we right. actually put across so i liked that point of like we're not about like lofty ideas what do we actually need to do to make it happen so i liked that point at least so here's the problem for nikki in the focus groups she routinely gets kind of like people saying i like nikki haley she seems all right you know whatever she is never their choice for president she's never the tap choice uh not close and so she's in a weird space where people like Tim Scott's actually got this too, where they like her. Okay, they like her. Okay. They like him. Okay. But they don't want to vote for them for president. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, you wrote when you called that like the imaginary GOP primary where there's these like normie candidates that think they have a real chance. Uh, and, you know, you talk about Haley being one of them. Is she like, does she not understand what's happened to the Republican party or like what is she doing right now? Like, what's her end game? I have a theory on this, but what's yours? I'd love to hear your theory. Um, I think maybe it's ego. I, I do think that you can get... So here's something that people... That's sometimes hard to wrap your head around, right? Two, the, these two things can be true. Nikki Haley is not cannot win a majority of this party. But there's still a pretty decent chunk of people that really like Nikki Haley, right? And so she has big events in South Carolina. When she's out on the street, people see her and they're like, Hey, Nikki, you're my girl. You know, I've told this story before about John Huntsman, right? Like... We went to we we ended up getting seventeen percent to New Hampshire. That's kind of a lot. When we're walking down the street in Manchester and Portsmouth, like people are shouting at them, "Hey, John, like love you." So you know we're we're filling up town halls, and so you can convince yourself, okay, all right, something's happening here. I can feel it in the streets. You know, I can feel the energy at the events, and I, so I, my guess is that there's some of that at play. Um, maybe there's some of I don't. She doesn't know what else to do with her life at play. So why not give it a shot? And then I think, you know, I was talking to a political reporter who's doing a profile on her. I, you know, I, I think that there's this, okay, you get this momentum up to 20, and then you get into magical thinking. You're like, all right, well, what happens if I get to 20, and then Trump goes to jail, right? Or like, what happens if I get to 20, and then I get to 30, and then people start giving me a second look, then the polls are showing me up 10, right? You start to kind of talk uh, talk yourself into it but the, the problem is that like she just that, that's her ceiling kind of uh and and I, I don't know that she realizes that maybe I, I'm not sure I think that she and people like Mike Pence are discovering just now the extent to which the party is not like they thought because they spend too much time at AEI events yeah. and other mainstream events and they knew that they they dabble in the stuff right she like go and do a photo op with diamond and silk uh, or whatever, but like, I don't think they realized quite the hostility ultimately to the pre-Trump uh, politicians. My theory of her case was uh, that she was running to cut a deal with somebody 
by South Carolina. Like, I actually mm-hmm. think that Rhonda, she thought if Rhonda Santis got, was running neck and neck with Trump, that somebody would come to her with a deal for her 12% in South yeah. Carolina. Um, and that's, that's where I think she was thinking. Um, I just, I, she, but she never quite, I think, I think that m- sounded good on paper. The problem was, is like to be that person, she had to like ding up DeSantis and she's had this sort of strange way of navigating Trump where she says like at, on the debate stage, she said, you know, Trump is, you know, we got most unpopular president. So she's like, she's kind of hitting them because she knows she sort of has to, to differentiate, but also talks about what a great president he was and how she's on his side and how she's in his cabinet. Um, I mean, like the way that Pence talks about the Trump Pence administration, you know, to like get some of Trump's validity off, like to try to capture some of that. It's just impossible to have it both ways for these guys. Okay. The other thing uh, for Nikki Haley that I want to flag, and I was, I got to say, I was a little bit surprised when I started hearing this in the focus groups when I was asking about Haley which is that plenty of people in the focus groups over the last few months had real qualms about whether or not the country is ready for a woman as president. Let's listen. I'm imagining her like meeting with Putin or the, you know, the Chinese leader, et cetera. Um, I just, I don't think she has a chance at winning. And I'm just going to say it. Like, I think that not enough people will vote for her. I think some women will be against her because she's Republican. And I also know some men, like they're not going to vote for a woman as president, whether it's right or wrong. I feel like voting for her is a vote down the drain. I don't want to sound, you know, bad or anything, but I just think I I prefer male presidents and I think they (laughs) are just stronger talking and speaking and in a lot of different areas. So um, I don't know. I would just prefer a male candidate. I don't dislike Nikki Haley. I don't, you know, have anything bad to say about her. I would just prefer DeSantis or Trump. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's just a personal thing. Um, I voted for females for Senate. Um, in Congress before, Females. but as a president, I would just like to see a male. Uh, it's not that I don't like her. I'm 100% opposed to a female president, which is probably not going to be a very popular thing to say, but I was in the military, and so many other world leaders will not respect us with a female leader and won't listen to anything that we do or say, and we open ourselves up to way more attacks. It, the world is just not ready for that yet. This is not, so I played you some of them, it a lot, like, when they would say it out loud, other people would sit there and nod. Like, uh, it, it, this, like, and the whole world leaders won't respect them. Uh, you know, I just, they, what, what might happen if they're on their period? They might be having a <laughs> pillow fight in the West Wing. I mean, this stuff is like, that was, that was alarm. I, I, and you knew that people thought it, but like, that they felt comfortable enough to be that explicit. Well, don't, that's sort of my question for you is, I think this is what Trump did, right? Uh, Trump has just made it okay to say this stuff out loud. They don't, and p- people, he's like, people are kind of like, well, maybe somebody won't like this, but like, they're gonna, they're gonna vocalize it, which I guess, I don't know. If you're gonna think it, I guess I'd rather know you think it than, uh, you know, you just, I, I don't know. I don't know how, but it, it but it is a, it was, pervasive this and you know one of those where you got to want to come through the glass and just be like have you all ever heard of margaret thatcher the iron lady like do, do we need to watch a movie do we need to watch a movie let me let me let, we're gonna and we're ending this focus group right now and i'm putting as i'm putting on an iron lady documentary for you guys and you're all gonna sit here and spend the next 30 minutes watching it yeah it's some wild stuff and and you know i, I got asked when early on in the primary about nikki haley you know people would be like uh what do you think people will vote for a woman and whatever. And I was like, yes, I think I like, I was like, this is like kind of a passe conversation. And then I was like, actually wrong, 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 wrong. I mean, lots of people will, but there is still this sort of real, this real voice. Uh, and I think Trump's given it, given it more permission. Um, well, we now, wouldn't want somebody emotionally unstable in the white house. So better, get better hand the keys over to Donald Trump. Yeah. You know, what's funny though. Uh, these same people, I bet if it was, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene or uh, Lauren Boebert or Kerry Lake, they might get on board. But as we know, like you said, this is really just about for president because mm. they got to walk and talk tough. But Senate, right. Senator, I, yeah. I voted for females. I voted for females. Put it on a shirt. All right. Let's talk about there was a bit. Let's talk about Scott Mentum, Tim Scott. 
I was like, uh, Scott who? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, he got pretty negative reviews coming out of that first debate. Um, But, you know, he actually gets some love, uh, like Nikki, uh, from the focus groups over the last few months. Let's listen. I saw him with this interview. Um, He shredded the the people on The View. Yeah, Uh, that was great. For me, he's just genuine. And did you see his interview on The View? He was outstanding. Uh He defended himself. He defended what he believed in. And I actually think that they were, they were hushed. They really had no response. I think he is going to uh, either pick up or pretty much dominate the evangelical Christian vote. I will always have a soft spot for Tim Scott. I have voted for him since he ran for county council in Charleston County. And I think he's a wonderful man. If this is not his time around, I hope his time is coming soon because he is wonderful. His story is wonderful. He is even handed. He's a gentleman. The good news is I don't think we've had anybody in the focus group who's been said out loud they will not vote for a black candidate. So that's good. Great news there. Those ladies on The View were hushed. Though. They were hushed. There he put them in their place. Yeah, they were hushed. There's, he had a big, he had, a, he had a little bump. Yeah. He got a bump after the view thing. That's like what, that's what you, that clip went viral and that's what you really hear people mention about him. Uh, but what do you make of, uh, so he like, I actually haven't read anything to this effect, but I suspect post that first debate performance that all the donor money that was going to him is maybe moving to Nikki. What do you think? I got to tell you. I, you're not supposed to say this as a political pundit, but I am just mystified by what Tim Scott is doing, what the point of the campaign is. Um, maybe this, maybe that those focus groups provide an answer. Maybe it's just simply, a, uh, you know, some rich guy wants to give me a lot of money, so I'm going to use this to raise my profile and I can maybe sell some books and go out on the speaking circuit. I, I, I really... I really just don't. I don't know. And I'm making it my mission to try to figure this out. So maybe I can have a report for you by a different podcast. But I, I, it's so weird. The whole thing is so weird. Like he didn't, he barely talked to the debate. Now he's got the fake, the fake girlfriend or real girlfriend, whatever, that he won't show people that he's talking about. It's really embarrassing and cringe. Uh, and it's like. He has what? a fake girlfriend from, that lives in Niagara Falls? I mean, I get maybe this girlfriend is real. I don't know. I, 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 by the way, I'm not even judging him over this. I don't, it's just like, why is he doing this? He was on a stage in Iowa where like a, 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 one of the local Iowa politicians asked him, he's like, so I hear you have a special lady. And he's like, yeah, I've got a nice Christian lady in my life. But then, then he doesn't say her name or doesn't mention her. And it's just like, he has a Canada girlfriend. I like. I don't. Why are you doing? Like, why are you putting yourself through this? Like, you're not going to be the president. Donald Trump is never going to pick you. Would you want to be Donald Trump's vice president? The whole thing. I. I if, uh, anyway, I, I'm mystified by this one. I know I'm supposed to come onto this podcast to provide insight. I have insight on all the other candidates. This one is just a flat mystery to me. That's okay. Tell me, I, the one insight, uh, I, I liked your piece that you wrote about the super PACs lighting their money on fire. Oh, yeah, sure. Uh, so why don't you hit that for a second? Because I think yeah. there's, like, the, in the fantasy primary, there's still a lot of real money sloshing around. Yeah, there is. And so this is, and again, you there is, there's certain kinds of things that you can do with money, right? You know this, you, you run PACs. This is not to say that all super PACs are not are worthless, right? Like the, I don't run a say, candidate super PAC. I run, like a like, a, you know... It's a, the Republican voters against Trump uh, right. type super PAC, which I'm is saying. meant to do a very s- tiny, like a slice mission. A specific thing. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And there are certain things that you can do with paid advertising in, in, tw- in the year of our Lord 2023, when everybody's on YouTube and TikTok and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and watching TV, but they have, they've cut the cord and some haven't, right? Like it's not like the old days where you can put on an ad during the nightly news in Des Moines and have everybody see it and have everybody learn about your candidate. And you can maybe, you can inject something into the conversation. Like you, it's all too diffuse now. So there's certain things you can do with money. Right, like, uh, and Tim Scott is running a ton of soft, gauzy ads about how he's a nice guy. Included the view thing, so for people that didn't see it on their social media, they saw it on TV. Like he really gave it to those ladies on the View, and you know, and 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 that I think you're probably seeing that impact in these focus groups when people are saying nice things about him. Right, like they're like, he seems nice, he seems good, he's a black Republican, and he's nice to Trump. And right, so you can do that, you know, or you can you can inject one negative thing about an opponent. 
into in, via, via television advertising, right? Or you can do what, what Arvad is trying to do, like talk to a small, narrow percentage of voters. But this idea that you can spend $60 million and, and, and run ads about a person and, and that people are going to be sitting there watching their TV and be like, oh, yeah, maybe I'll be for Tim Scott for president is insane. It's insane. It is like, like people, everyone in their life is talking about this race. Like, this is not a city council race, right? Like, everyone knows Donald Trump. They've deeply held views about Donald Trump. They might have Donald Trump merchandise. I, 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 Donald Trump is talked about at church, on sports talk radio, on cable TV. The presidential race is everywhere, particularly in these early states. And, and, and so running a 30-second ad that's like, Tim Scott is a conservative man who did a good interview on The View, and you can count on him. Like, whose mind is that going to change? Like, it's just, it, it's crazy. And yet these, these consultants are continuing to just light money on fire running these kinds of ads that worked in 1996 because there weren't all these other places where people were getting information about the candidates. And there wasn't a leading candidate in the field in 1996 that was like the most famous person in history besides Hitler. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't want to get into it too deeply, but the consultant class that's bilking the billionaire class uh, all together to like run this fantasy primary. Like it is like yep. they're conjuring something and it's none of it's real. Like Trump, how much money has Trump even raised? Like he's literally spends most of his money on lawyers. Yeah. And lawyers, the indictments are like his campaign strategy. Yeah. He had a, he had, Trump did one of the one things you can do with this money early in the race. He did spend money going negative on DeSantis in Iowa on TV and he yep. brought up how DeSantis was disloyal and da 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 da, da. And, and so, you know, like I said, I'm not saying that there's nothing you, th – that probably had some impact on the margins, um, you know, because people didn't know DeSantis that well, and they were – you know, he was defining them. And, but, but he's not spending that much money. Like, it's not like Trump is running – it's not like there's a bunch of TV ads being spent in South Carolina right now that's like, Donald Trump, businessman, you know, <laughs> like built 50 miles of wall. Right? Like they don't uh, – uh, you know, this is uh, – the Trump campaign – Say what you want about it. I mean, it's a grift. He's, he's redirecting a lot of money to lawyers, but they, they recognized something, you know, dating all the way back to 2016, that all the professional po the political consultants didn't. And, and yet, for some, and for some reason, the professional political consultants in 2024, working for Tim Scott and Ron DeSantis, are running the same strategy that failed in 2016. It makes me mad, really. Yeah. Give me the uh... I, or give the gunny <laughs> to some poor kids. Like, this is crazy. These guys uh, don't need beach houses. Yeah, well, you know what? What makes me crazy about it is that um, they're going to spend all this money in a Republican primary for nothing, and they won't spend any money in a general election to try to, deep, to try to defeat Trump. And did you see? And here's where these things could work. This drove me crazy. Did you see this political article about the DeSantis Super PAC a couple weeks ago, where it was like they're micro targeting? They're doing all they're these micro targeting tests. on the phones. Yeah, yeah, they're testing all these different groups, and they're testing. You know, they've got a ton they're testing Atumwa, Iowa, and then they're testing you know Cedar Falls, and they're using control groups, and they're determining that if they use this message or this vehicle, a text message versus uh, like that 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 six percent better. You know, they'll get a 6% better favorability. And I'm like, you're losing by 50. You're losing by 50. 6% better favorability does nothing. But to your point, that stuff could matter in a general election, very narrow, right? Like, like That's moving 6% right. right. of these soft Republicans from Trump to nothing or from nothing to Biden, that could, that could save us, the, the country. Moving 6% of people from, from DeSantis to go from 12 back to 18 that doesn't do that. That's just, that's just lighting money on fire. All right. Just to wrap it up on Tim Scott though. Uh, he, that August debate for him, uh, was, was not great. And so I want to play how people thought about Scott and then some of the other candidates they deemed irrelevant after that debate. He tried to insert himself a couple of times, but he, he just was not aggressive enough. Yeah. And that's noticeable. And you don't want to be noticed like that. Tim Scott, Chris Christie, and Asa, or Asa, however you pronounce it, I don't, like, you don't want someone that's not memorable, and I think that they just are not contenders, especially when you're trying so badly to go against Biden that I think is pretty not liked by everyone. I would put Bergen in that category, too. Top four, so it doesn't Bergen. really make a difference if it's Bergen <laughs> lost or uh, Tim Scott lost or 
Asa Hutchinson lost. It's like they were not really out there. They didn't stand out. One name we haven't said, uh, or nobody's mentioned, is Mike Pence. <laughs> I was actually really disappointed. And I mean, I thought he had some good answers, but I was disappointed in how him and Vivek kind of went at each other. I thought it was kind of embarrassing, <laughs> when, especially when he made the comment about, well, let me slow it down for you. I don't know. It just made me see him a little differently, and I didn't appreciate that comment. Going back to Pence, what kept on going through my mind as he was talking is I couldn't get the Trump uh, indictments out of my head. I just couldn't. So I think we're going to do a whole Pence episode, so I don't want to dig like so deeply into Pence. Uh, but I do think there is this, like, we're going to, we'll have just watched the second debate, but like, what is Mike Pence well, doing? What is... It, but- Oh, yeah, you you're won't. going to a Beyonce. <laughs> you won't, won't you're gonna go, you, Yeah, I hope. I watched all it, these focus groups and it only affirmed my decision to go to Beyonce. Like, yeah. it's a little, cause I forgot, you didn't play this clip, but one of the women, the most MAGA woman in the in the group says, you know, basically something to the effect of when, when uh, you know, the, the moderator is asking who won the debate, she comes to her and she's like, well, nobody's, nobody said Trump yet, but I think it was basically Trump. And then basically everyone on the That's Zoom's right. like, yeah, but yeah, you're yeah. right. It was basically Trump. And I was like, okay, I don't need to do the second debate. If Trump's not, if the winners <laughs> of the debate isn't showing up, why do I need to show up? I'm sorry for interrupting. Uh, no, that's okay. Uh, it's just, I just, it's like Asa, God bless him. Mm. And Will Hurd, God bless him. Mm. And you and I disagree on this, but Chris Christie, God bless him in this particular moment, but not before. Uh, you know, there's just like, it's like listening to people be like, what's his, Issa, Issa, you know, who is this guy? Uh, <laughs> I throw Bergen in that category too. It's yeah, like wrong Bergen. Uh, I only, there was only negative reviews for, for Bergen. Uh, I mean, what, just give me just like a strategist uh, sort of rank punditry. Like, when do you think these guys start to drop? Yeah. I mean, the one guy saying nobody mentioned Mike Pence, that was the deepest cut. So, you know, we don't need to discuss Pence anymore because that was like kind of all you need to say. The focus group forgot he existed. I think that it's different for different ones. Uh, I I assume Asa will drop any day. God love him. I'm with you on that. He did have one woman in the focus group who really liked him. um, And so that was heartwarming. Um, But... Uh, you know, Bergman has a lot of money, so he's just doing this for attention, right? So what's the point of dropping if you're him? Uh, Chris Christie, uh, we don't need to fight about Chris Christie, but I'm, uh, he said he's going to stand through New Hampshire, which, as I've said from the start, only serves to help Donald Trump. He can, do, he can say whatever he wants, but Chris Christie in a New Hampshire is not helpful. Chris Christie endorsing someone else for New Hampshire, it would be helpful, um, conceivably. Uh, but it sounds like he's going to stay through to New Hampshire. Um, who am I forgetting? I might. Pa- I, what are you doing if you're my, again? I, I guess I, I already did this once with Tim Scott. It's hard for me to get in the head of Mike Pence too. I mean, um, I, I, I do think at this point he has seen reality, you know, and and so maybe he sees that there is some um, some greater mission. You know, I've I've always said about presidential campaigns. Sometimes there is a better uh, there is a mission for entering a presidential race that is greater than trying to win, right? Because it is the opportunity. To, to get on a stage and speak to a broad audience that you wouldn't have otherwise. And so I think that that's probably where Mike Pence is. He's like, let's run through the tape in Iowa, get on these stages, talk about the Reagan three-legged stool and talk about conservatism versus populism. And um, I, I think that's probably what, what is Pence is thinking at this point. The amount of sound that we have of people talking about how much they dislike or don't care about Mike Pence is like unbelievable. <laughs> And I, I have said this for a long time. They must be running their own focus groups. They must be listening. Like, there's no way they're not hearing what we're hearing. Uh, Maybe you should run a bonus episode that's just like anti-Mike Pence porn. Well, it's just, you, <laughs> just you saying, hey, guys, uh, this is a midweek episode of the focus group. And I'm not going to give you any analysis here. But here's 40 minutes of people shitting on Mike Pence. <laughs> uh. I think we could put together like two hours. Uh <laughs> All right. On that note, Tim Miller, my friend, thank you so much for wrapping up our two-part season premiere with us. And thanks to all of you groupies for listening to the Focus Group podcast. Remember to subscribe, rate and review, uh, and then also subscribe to The Bulwark on YouTube. We're doing video now, so uh, I let you see me red-faced after working out. So next week, hey, we're going to check in with Democrats, give people a break from Trump and Republicans, uh, the state of the country, and take their temperature on their excitement about Joe Biden and Kamala Harris's re-election prospects. You're not going to want to miss it. Bye-bye.